Gorilla Physics. Yeah. Hi guys and girls, I'm going to talk you through Young Modulus today. Um, I hope that you're already familiar with Hooke's Law. If you're not, maybe it wasn't actually on your GCSE syllabus, in which case I suggest you go ahead and look back at my GCSE Hooke's Law video. Hooke's Law is pretty simple. Force is proportional to extension and springs have a stiffness or objects have stiffness, K, which is the gradient of the graph. So whereas Hooke's Law applies to a certain piece of the material, the Young modulus applies to that material. So this spring has a given stiffness, K, and it has a, the steel in it has a Young modulus. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about in the video today. So Hooke's Law is about given things, whereas Young modulus is about the actual material, be that steel or elastic. So simply put, Young modulus is the ratio of stress to strain. And we're going to be defining those two. Still what you know applies to it, you knew from Hooke's Law, that the steeper the line, the um, stiffer the spring. So this has a higher stiffness than this one. That is still the same when we look at a Young modulus graph. And still this is the case where this is the elastic region, the proportional section. This is still the elastic region for the material, the region at which it will return to its original shape. It showed elastic behaviour. And this is still the plastic region, these latter parts here, where it is deforming plastically. That means it's a permanent change. You need to link the different shapes of graph for young modulus to the different material properties that you need to know and have a really good definition for in your A-level physics. So the first thing we're going to need to understand then is exactly what stress and strain are. So sigma is the symbol for stress. It's a force over a cross-sectional area. So it's an internal pressure, if you like, in a material. It does actually have the same units as pressure. Uh, strain is defined as the percentage change or the ratio of change of length. So x is the original length and delta x is the change in length. Now I want you to really notice the same two things that were in Hooke's Law, the force and the extension. And actually it's an extension, it's delta x. And actually think about where they are on the um, axes as well. Just to let you know, this could be either a tensile uh, strain, tensile strain, which is a positive change in length, or a compressive strain, which is a negative change in length. So let's just try and understand what the units of these are, because sometimes they like to ask you that type of question. Let's think about our units of force, the Newton, and our unit of area, the meter squared. So the units of stress are Newton per meter squared. And that may actually ring some bells to you because force over area is the same as pressure. We can express that in the Pascals. What are the units for strain then? Well, delta x extension is in meters and original length is also in meters. So therefore the units of strain are non-existent. Meters divided by meters is one. It doesn't have a unit. It's a ratio. You could discuss it as a percentage and then you'd be multiplying it by a hundred. So what I've done is just actually replaced stress and strain with the formula for them. So now I've got a much better graph for understanding why the stiffness is still the gradient of the graph. If this one is twice as steep as that one, it has a stiffness twice as much as that one. Well, why is that? Because force is on my y-axis and delta x is on my x-axis, just like my Hooke's Law graph. So carrying on discussing Young modulus in terms of the algebra, we should just consider some of the more difficult questions that come up. And they are more difficult when they ask you about 
one of the four variables in the Young Modulus. So what I really like to do with Young Modulus is actually input the two equations into the equation there. These are going to be some of the hardest ones about this in AS. So this f over a goes in instead of the sigma. Now, there's only two lines in maths, so f must be on the top line and divided by a. Now, this goes in instead of the epsilon. And what actually happens, because it's on the bottom line here, is the fraction is flipped, it's inverted. So we get an equation that looks like this. So sometimes they like to ask you, well, what effect would doubling the force have on the young modulus? Well, actually, that would double that if all the others stayed the same. But of course, with a force comes an extension. So the young modulus, for most of a material's behaviour in that proportional region, is going to stay the same. So what happens then when we get our plastic regions, let's say, like this? What happens when we get our plastic regions like these? Well, actually, no longer is Young modulus a constant. The Young modulus is the gradient. Now, for the same stress, we're getting a continuously increasing strain. And we say that actually the, the material has been, has been damaged, it's changed its own material properties. And that could be for a number of reasons. I want to talk to you about some of the experiments that you probably do into Young Modulus. The first ones we like to do are simply clamping normally a sweet, actually, a strawberry lace. And you measure the original length of that strawberry lace. Okay, you can't simply measure the extension because you need to know the, the original length for your Young Modulus. Before adding any masses, you measure the diameter. You measure the diameter normally at about five places and take yourself an average, whatever that would be. Now, diameter is not in our equation there, but we're using diameter to calculate A, our cross sectional area. So we're actually interested in our area, which is pi r squared. Once you've got your area, your average cross section area, you can start loading your strawberry lace. Add one mass and the lace will extend. You measure that extension. and add another mass. It will extend more. Measure the new extension, and so on and so forth. Your slotted masses, each one being about 0.1 of a newton, although you can be more accurate than that, is your value for F. And from all those measurements, you're going to plot yourself the graph. We use sweets to introduce the idea of young modulus often because they've got a very low young modulus. So you get to see, for quite a small chain in force, you get to see quite a lot of extension. And therefore, you actually get to see that plastic region as well. Um, but I hope you will get a chance to actually use... Um, something with a higher young modulus, and it's usually not the highest, not steel wire, but some copper wire. And you have to be able to measure very precisely with the micrometer the, the width. And actually, because you're dealing with very small changes in length with this copper wire, you actually use something called Searle's apparatus. And Searle's apparatus, in fact, compares a wire that you're loading with a wire that is like pre-loaded. And the wire that is pre-loaded has a kilogram mass on it. You start the wire you're extending with a kilogram mass and you add 
extra masses each time. And what actually happens between here and here, the, the Searles apparatus, is there's a vernier scale which allows you to measure uh, to 0.1 of a millimetre the extension of this wire. So it, it's actually a very precise way of measuring um, delta x. And you, you still need about two meters of wire to actually get a notable uh, effect. And your change is gonna be um, only about one or two millimeters during that whole time. So you have to be able to measure very precisely with that apparatus there. The other way to do that, of course, and is quite often the way it's done, just practically, because it's quite hard to find some way you've got two meters to hang some wire and work for a long time is just actually to extend one piece of wire over a very long distance. So actually to get some desks in a row and clamp the wire horizontally. Maybe with a pulley system to allow you to add the masses you need to and measure the extension of just that one piece of wire. Maybe by having a bit of tape that you see how far it actually moves. So there's ways and means to get around this. I'm sure you will do that at some point. So let's just zoom in a little bit more on our stress over strain graph. So I've already talked about the elastic region. Okay, now there's different points on the graph that you're gonna be asked to know what they mean. Here where the straight line, where the line stops being straight, is called the limit of proportionality. It's just simply put the limit the point at which the graph stops being proportional. Now, beyond that, but not far beyond that, is going to be the elastic limit. So that's the limit of the elastic region of the graph, where it's going to start behaving elastically. Then, a little bit beyond that, somewhere around here, we're going to have what we call the yield point. Now, the yield point is where the stress is so much and the, the material has strained so much that the material properties have changed and it's yielded, if you like, it's become a different material. It's got a different molecular property. Then as we go forward, we need, just need to know what the highest point on the graph is called. The highest point is called the ultimate tensile stress because it is the highest possible stress. And then finally, wherever this is, the point at which we're not getting any more extension because it's broken, is called the breaking point, okay? Or the breaking stress, or even the breaking strain. So I promise you some graphs and how they link to different material properties then. This first one I've drawn is a material which is quite stiff, you can see it's quite a steep line. It's also quite tough. It does deform plastically to a certain region, okay, so you can add extra force after its, um, its limit of proportionality. So we'll call this one our tough material. Notice I haven't used the word strong or anything like that. This is something like a rubber material, which has quite an interesting curve, a stress strain curve. Here, initially, uh, it takes quite a lot of force to get a small amount of extension. Then it behaves uh, quite stretchy, it's not very stiff at all in its kind of middle region. And then suddenly towards the end, its maximum uh, extension you will actually start to put, need to put in more and more and more uh, force to get a smaller extension out as well. So this would be something like a rubber. Very, very interesting shape of curve. Here, this one is a brittle material because it's quite stiff. Remember, steepness of these graphs is stiff. It doesn't have a large plastic region. It actually breaks for only a very small plastic deformation. And then lastly here, this was a ductile material. And ductile is about being able to stretch the material for a little extra force. So we say it can be like drawn into wires, something which is ductile. 
So it has a small elastic region and then after that it begins to deform plastically for little extra stress. Whenever you're given a graph like that, I would suggest to you the best way to think about it is where is the force that is on the y-axis always, where is the extension that is on the x-axis. So you can always think about where does increasing force or increasing extension sit on the graph. Obviously it does have area and original length but those are just the dimensions of the piece that you're investigating. The force and extension is actually of that material therefore. We've kind of eliminated the dimensions of the material from our graph. I hope that helps you understand in your young modulus. Okay. Thanks for watching this video from Gorilla Physics. I really hope you've enjoyed it, and if you have, why not go ahead and subscribe. I hope you found it useful, so please tell your friends, and every like and share that we get helps us be more useful to more people.